All right, we are live today on LinkedIn and packed YouTube. Super excited to be here. I'm going to bring a special guest up on stage in just a minute, Tina Woods, author of Live Longer with AI. Yes, today we're going to learn how can we live longer with artificial intelligence. We are also encouraging great questions and comments to be posted on LinkedIn and YouTube because we will select three people to win a free copy of the Live Longer with AI book. So super exciting. Um, as you're joining the session, one thing I want to ask, and this is kind of, we came up with this with, with Tina, is how long do you think you're going to live? I know it might be a daunting, a scary question, but just give us either a number or some thoughts on how long do you think you're going to live? We're not trying to depress people out there, but we do want to get some answers because I think it's going to be uh, interesting to hear. At this point, I'm gonna go ahead and bring Tina up onto our virtual stage. Hello, Tina. Hello. How are you? <laughs> Being on the show here today. Thank you for inviting me. All right, this is this is awesome. So I've asked the question, and as people are joining, they're going to let us know how long they they think they're going to live. Yeah. Uh, I think let's let's start with you while they're answering that. How long do you think you're going to live? Well, I have thought about this because it's obviously um, I'm immersed in this whole space, uh, trying to understand it myself. So I'm 56 and um, I have tried out all kinds of uh, life calculators, healthy life calculators, some of them better than others. And generally they say that I will probably live um, between, well, to about 94 to 97. So that's not too bad. And that's assuming that I carry on with my lifestyle in the way that I'm going about things at the moment, which, you know, I try and eat good, try and eat well, do, you know, get my exercise, you know, all that sort of stuff. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. Yeah. I think I'm going to, I'm going to go with Adrian here and agree with him. I'm going to live forever. <laughs> <laughs> I know the mindset that I truly will live forever. We've got a bunch of fun answers here. Okay. So um, Scott Williams says 90. Yeah. Mohi 56. Okay. Kind yeah. of my opinion, but it's it's your you know your guesstimate. Aramis says eighty. Sergey yeah. is winning so far. Okay. Then one. He's gonna. Yeah. <laughs> Anuket is eighty. Yep. A lot of interesting. Okay. More than a hundred years. Okay. Hasina has a good point. Uh, till we feel I am healthy. Yeah. Because I think that's important. We don't want to live two hundred years if we're just strapped to some kind of device and we can't really move or anything um so george here 57 so i think um yeah we're getting the right. answers <laughs> 88 but i think so that's it's a it's very interesting just to see the the spread of different ages and i think uh so we might have had one or two um sort of immortalists or transhumanists you know sort of answering the question to live forever but i think that the, the point that you just mentioned about well do we would we want to live forever if we're actually living in crappy health or if we don't feel so good so i think that's the real question and actually i had a, a an argument not an argument but I, I had a little argument with the publisher you know pat you know the title of the books it's called live longer with ai but what i I didn't want to do was to um, imply that the book was about life extension, you know, living forever. Um, it's actually about health span. And I think that's really where it's at is health span and having a good quality life for as long as possible. So, uh, so just to point out, just to uh, pick up on a couple of uh, interesting uh, points, just bearing out the whole range that we've seen. So I think a lot of us, you know, and I'm including people sort of in middle age like myself, I think with developments that we're seeing today, we have a very, very, very good chance of living past 100. In fact, um, Peter Diamantes, you know, who many of you will know if you follow the sort of the, 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 the sort of the tech, exponential sort of tech trends, he uh, he's the uh, XPRIZE founder and um, has uh, founded uh, Singularity University. So he's saying that the is the new 60 with developments as, as, as is taking place now. And I think he's probably right, but I think if you speak to some of the um, leading scientists, and I and in my book I've interviewed quite a lot of the, the rock stars um, around the science of aging, people like Arthur de Grey, Nir Barzilai, um, Jose Candera, these are all people who are leaders in their field, they talk about and they do, you know, mind-boggling research and understanding the basis of aging and how we can use exponential technologies to help us live well certainly to 120 150 is, is even being talked about things like longevity escape velocity that the sheer pace of change with ai and, and synthetic um, and computational biology and, and things like that and regenerative medicine and 
all these sort of different things that I that I talk about in the book, you know, will be so quick that actually um, they'll be quicker than our, the, the, than the time that it's taking us to age. So we'll eventually reach this point where we can actually become immortal. So that's what some of the futures are sort of predicting. So, but I think you know, hand on heart, I think you know, with um, I think a lot of us just if we follow um, and the science is showing us. Uh, giving us the evidence now under under underlying you know all the you know things that we kind of know about you know what our grandmothers and mothers tell us about eating your you know you know your greens sleeping well seeing your friends getting your fresh air all those sorts of things I think if we do all those things and lead help you know have um, and try and lead a life with healthy behaviors then we'll probably we'll probably easily get past 80 maybe sort of 90. I think if you're trying to really get to the 120 and the 100, certainly the 150 mark, which some people are talking about, is realistic. Um, you know, you're, you're going to have to, you're, you are going to need to um, go into the more what I call the other sorts of technologies and interventions. And I'm, you know, I'm talking about you know, things like regenerative medicine, you know, cellular therapies, gene therapies, all those sorts of things, which are, you know, really, really driving a lot of the thinking to kind of get to that next stage. Um, so. Uh, so, so yeah, and I think, you know, if you look at, so Mir Barzilai, who is my dear friend, who I actually was on the, the platform with just very briefly yesterday at this conference called Metabesity, which is all about how the clustering of chronic diseases that we tend to get as we get older, they all have at their root some of the underlying biological basis of aging. So a lot of the science now is actually really trying to understand what is really going on at a cellular level, at a genetic level, and how we can intervene there. And um, and I think uh, his research with centenarians, they've got something in their genes that makes them live that long. And then suddenly, and so there's something genetic that's keeping them going. So they're trying to unravel that. And then suddenly they'll get sick and then die. And then, so their period where they're living in bad health is like really short. Whereas for, unfortunately for a lot of people, that period is, can be quite long. And obviously what we want to do is really tighten and make smaller that period when we're living in, in poor health. Because who wants to live forever if you're going to be feeling miserable? Yeah, absolutely. I have a question for you. I'm not sure if you know this off the top of your head, but what was the age of the longest um, person's life? Like basically, who lived the longest and how long? Yes, yeah, so there's a lady called, uh, I think it's, oh, I, I can't remember her name. It's Francoise. Uh, so there's a lady in France who lived to 124. Apparently, that's the longest person. I think that's documented and has the, the evidence behind it. So 124 seems to be the, the limit at the moment. Now, some people will dispute that, but she's uh, she's kind of considered, you know, the the, the one, the, the, the case, the, the, the person who's mentioned most often is this, hmm. this lady. <laughs> okay, very interesting. Because I know there's probably some myths of people living, you know, hundreds of years, and but this is the actual documented 124. So that's my new goal, 125, guys. It's not forever. I'll take 125. I'll beat the record. <laughs> Um, that's the scary thing is you can have, you know, some, some, some of the people are talking about, you know, being able to transplant different body parts and all that sort of stuff so that by eventually you can just be a mix of all sorts of different sort of organs and body parts, you know, <laughs> so who knows where that's going to head. But, but in the end, our bodies do actually age. And that's the weird thing too, is that different tissues, they age at different rates. So, you know, so some of the, the work is just like replacing what is kind of cogged out. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, but then you sort of ask, then you, you, you sort of, you sort of ask the question, well, what makes you you if you're constantly replacing what makes you you? And most people will, will mm -hmm. think, well, it's your thoughts and your consciousness and all that sort of stuff that makes you you. But even, you know, but even people like, you know, Elon Musk, you know, it's this whole kind of implanting stuff in your brain, you know, the neural link. And, you know, it's, 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 you start getting into this weird sort of territory about, you know, well, what becomes human, what, what doesn't. And people like Noah, um, Yuval Harari talks about, you know, that eventually, you know, the algorithms will take over and AI will take over and become this inorganic being they become the next humans you know but um but you know there are different philosophies uh, that talk about this but you know i'm kind of more interested in the here and now and, and mm -hmm. making have a really good life right now <laughs> yeah absolutely so um tina let's go quickly back to the book so can you provide a brief intro of who you are what is this book about who is the book for and why did you write it i know it's like five questions in one but go sure. for it <laughs> so I, um, yeah, so as you know, Tina Woods, I wear, I do lots of different things, but pretty much over the last three years, I've been very, very involved working with business, public sector and government. 
um, on uh, ways to drive, you know, what I call sustainable change in health. And I'm really interested in, in preventative health. So this is after many, many years working more on what I call the sick space. So I used to do a lot of work. Uh, with the pharma industry, for example, pharmaceutical industry, and of course, you know, they, you know, we need, you know, good drugs, we need good treatments for when we really need them when we're ill. But actually, I, be, I was just much more interested in the role of technology. And of course, now we've got this huge demographic shift with a growing aging population, you know, these big disruptive forces that are actually changing how we need to see our health. So I was just really interested in the, the shifts and the paradigm shifts sort of make, moving from sort of the sick care model to the, the health and well-being model, and what we need to do as citizens and consumers to kind of really be in that space because I think that's really where it's at and and the one thing that I would say and I don't want to dwell too much on the COVID thing but I think um the, the, the COVID uh, pandemic has really thrust into the spotlight two things. First of all we have this terrible situation of health inequalities um, which have been really really exposed but we've also but it's also really exposed you know this chronic what I actually think is an even bigger epidemic which is the chronic diseases epidemic and I think if you look at westernized societies we've we basically have created a situation where all of our structures all of our institutions the way that we do things are all around chronic treating chronic diseases so like hospitals you know the answer at the moment by governments is to try and build more hospitals you know more treatments you know this so it's kind of focusing on the wrong end and we need to realign our priorities so i've been, always been really really fascinated by that so doing a lot of work in ai and data-driven technologies working with the nhs which um for the international audience you most of you will probably know that uh, the nhs it's a mass it's a it's a huge it's our healthcare system in the UK. It employs more than 1.4 million people who, by the way, can get the book for free now, which is great news. I think that's awesome, Tina. So 1.4 million people have access to your book for free. Well, yes. technically, yes. If they really want to, they can. Uh, and of course, that's thanks to Kat, uh, Pat, who got a great distribution deal with um, with the, uh, the online provider for Health Education England, who, by the way, are on a huge drive to increase health and digital and information literacy, because that's really important, especially coming out and as we get to live with a more online world and especially post COVID. So, um, but just going back to the original question. So I was approached um, and have, have had a long fascination because I studied genetics. I mean, I thought I was gonna be a doctor and I didn't become a doctor, but I studied genetics, uh, you know, this is like over 30 years ago now, but that was even before the Human Genome Project, which a lot of people probably have heard of. And of course, you know, in the early days, it was like hugely expensive, you know, to, you know, to, to do, you know, genome sequencing and, you know, all that sort of stuff. Whereas now the cost has, has driven, has become so much lower that this has spawned all the, the companies that we know about, like 23andMe and Ancestry and all these sort of companies that can, you know, easily, do, you know, do your DNA analysis now. And of course, that's kind of brought, brought it into the whole kind of consumer space now. But um, uh, so I um, was fascinated by all the stuff that was happening in longevity. And, 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 you know, two, three years ago, when people talked about longevity, you think about like Craig Venture and all these people, so these billionaires wanting to live forever and like spending their billions so that they could like fly around in jets and live forever and longer. And whereas now, actually, you know, I, I think it's moved a lot. And I think where it's at again, is going back to this health span. But um, uh, so I also run the all party parliamentary group for longevity in the UK. And uh, I was tasked and we set out and, and developed a strategy um, which we published actually early this year on mm -hmm. how can we give five extra years of healthy life expectancy. So not just a long life, but a healthy life, five extra years of healthy life expectancy while minimizing health inequalities, which is a big drag at the moment. So there's a gap of about 20 years at the moment in healthy life expectancy mm -hmm. in the poorest and richest, which is terrible and we need to address. So this, so we developed the strategy. What, what were the the key things that we must do as a country to to get this right? So it was in the government manifesto commitment. So it was a big, you know, and it's and it's also influenced um, a bunch of big government money going into what we're calling the grand challenges. And one of the grand challenges is in the aging society. So mm -hmm. I've been very involved in all that sort of sphere, and and so I've obviously developed, I guess, you know quite a lot of expertise and understanding about this wider ecosystem and what uh, you know around how do we keep people healthy and well and live better for longer and all these sorts of things so I was approached about a year and a half ago by Pat and and I was and I talk about this in the book I you know an algorithm found me you know and which it did actually and I was like well how did it find me what what was I doing that allowed me to find me and so and a lot of it comes down to just you know being and speaking and working with all the leading cutting edge people. And, and of course I thank them all because without them and without a few breaks, you know, I wouldn't have found myself in this privileged position. 
to be, you know, um, um, I guess, recruited by this leading tech publisher. So I thought, oh my goodness, how am I going to write this book? I'm so busy. But anyway, push can, you know, so in the end, I interviewed 30 amazing people. And in fact, um, more, of course, and of course, there's a lot of insights, you know, that are part of this book. And, um, and actually, we were supposed to publish in April, but then the COVID thing. I can what happened in April, Tina, that could have possibly derailed your plans on living longer? Well, as we know, that that virus started to wreak havoc. Um, so yeah. I think we were already in lockdown in, in, in the UK. And we thought we can't come out with a book on living longer um, when, you know, frankly, you know, there's obviously a lot of people around us who aren't having it so good. But actually, in a funny sort of way, it has made the book far better and far stronger because it's really put into the spotlight how important our health is yeah. around the world. And it's actually, and what's really interesting is how so linked it is to the wealth and prosperity for the future as well. And mm -hmm. kind of, and not to get too, you know, doom gladen and sort of, you know, but of course, going back to this health inequalities piece, this is really what has come out so, so shockingly. Um, you know, as a result of the pandemic and and also how we treat our older populations. You know, we've seen people, you know, dying in far higher numbers than they should have in the care homes. And that's not it's certainly the UK, but I know it's also happened in many other countries around the world, including the US and and also a lot of, you know, very good, you know, European countries who've got fantastic, you know, healthcare systems. So there's some pretty serious societal problems. And I think, you know, if harnessed well, I'm a great believer that technology, if harnessed well and ethically, can be a huge power for good and a force for good. And that's obviously what I'm interested in, which I speak a lot about in the book. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and just to remind people, we do have some really great questions that came in. I'll address them right now. Um, but as a reminder, you can have a free copy of the book. Three people will be selected based on best question asked. So go ahead and ask yeah. the questions, any questions about AI and living longer. She's promised to answer every single one. So. I think I can. <laughs> here we go. So question here from Pedro. Uh, when we talk about living longer as a metric, how do we balance living better or even define what better is? So that is such a good question. What is better? And I think, and what I find and what is so interesting is that um, clearly, clearly there are some recognized metrics in terms of measuring healthy life expectancy. And of course, there are metrics around and which scientists and healthcare professionals use about quality adjusted life years, for example. I mean, that's how the National Institute for Clinical Excellence in the UK, for example, evaluates new medicines and drugs. How much extra good quality um, you know, years do you get if you use this treatment? So there, there are, of course, you know, various metrics around that can kind of you know, describe what better looks like, you know, at a general kind of level. But, you know, in the end, and this is the fascinating thing, you know, doing this book and, and you know, and I asked that question, you know, what is the secret, you know, what it, what to you is the secret to a good, long, happy life? Um, and, and, and it is so individual. And I think that what is better is so unique to us. And, and I think, you know, the, the really powerful messages from the book is um, yes, we can harness technology. And yes, I think it, it can be a huge force for good. And I talk about at an individual level, but also at a much wider societal level. And I talk about geopolitics between like how big tech in the US, you know, a lot of, you know, we've got the most powerful companies in the world. It's profit driven. And, you know, and then of course there's a whole China, you know, WeChat and Tencent, you know, who are absolutely galloping ahead in AI. But of yeah. course, you know, they, they access data, whether they like it or not, on all their citizens. And there's a lot of sort of, you know, um, uh, negative media discussion around social credit policy. And, you know, so I talk about these broader themes, but actually fundamentally, when I asked everyone about what it's really important to them, it boils down to such basic fundamental things. What in the, in the end drives you as a person? What makes you want to live your life and what makes you want to live forever. And it's going to be very unique to everyone. And I think that's a real challenge for all of us. And I think that, and I speak to some religious leaders also, we talk about the God gene and immortality and spirituality. And there are transhumanists, for example, that have created almost like their own religion, you know, about how technology is kind of like the new religion. We are all guided by different things. And I think that's the one thing I would say that does actually, I think, still distinguish us from animals. Because I talk a lot about where we come from. We all come from bacteria, you know, the tree of life. And that, and that actually sets the basis for why, you know, understanding what we are as a, at a basic life form, you know, our cellular base of aging and how we've studied it, nematode worms and Drosophila flies and all that sort of stuff that I used to study in the lab when I was at university. You know, the, the biological mechanisms are very, very similar in terms of how we 
how we age, you know, as animals, biological beings. But the one thing that I don't think can be described by biology is this kind of like this thing that kind of, what is this spirit thing? What is this thing that makes us want to live up forever? Or, and what is it that keeps us going? You know, because you often hear about people will kind of just about hang on until they've just seen that person that they need to on their deathbed or whatever it might be. There's something there. And, and so I think what, what is better for the individual person is such a unique thing. But what I would say is that people who do tend to live the longest at the moment, if you, I mean, great if you've got the longevity genes, which, and which there are some, but the people who live the longest, they basically have got it pretty good. They mm -hmm. live in, a, in areas, and this is the blue zone countries, which um, I write about in my book. They live in areas where they're socially connected, they've got family around them, they're, they've got a, a sense of what the uh, Japanese call igigai, which is a sense of purpose, a sense of belonging. They, they've got great food, you know, they incorporate physical activity in their lives. They basically, as a, they, they seem to have got, you know, got this formula that just gives them a really rich, meaningful life. And there's, and ageism doesn't exist in these kind of, well, there's less ageism, mm -hmm. far less ageism, because I think venerating age and valuing the contribution as an older person is also really important. So I hope that kind of answers a little bit of that question. Yeah, absolutely. I just I want to share a quick story about the point you made of people having a purpose. So um, my from my husband's side, my daughter's great grandma came to the states from Ukraine. Yeah. She went to meet her first ever great grandchild, and she looks fine. We yeah. saw her after my my child was a few weeks old, and she actually passed away that night. And she wow. talked over and over again on the phone, like months, you know, months ago while I was still pregnant. She's like, all I'm waiting for is to see my first great grandchild. Yeah. And it was really creepy and scary because that same night we get a message saying she's passed. Like just yeah. really drastic happened. Yeah. I think that is a, that it, there's very much reality in that having a purpose. Mm -hmm. uh, your point about valuing you know, the elderly, I think that goes against, uh, I mean, it It also proves the point of having a purpose because if you go to the elderly and view them as the wise and the people who can contribute, they feel like they have a purpose, so they live on. And in yeah. some countries, that's, that's not the case where they're like, okay, you have to retire at this age, you're no longer necessary. Yeah. Do you know, it's so interesting. So just a couple of just points to add to that. So we had a, a an elderly neighbor. I mean, he's since passed, unfortunately, from cancer. But he he spoke a lot about wanting to feel useful. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so what gave him great joy is when he helped my sons, and they were small at the time, build a tree house. Because he was a carpenter and an electrician. He was very handy with his hands. And he was obviously just a bit bored, you know, being retired. And so even doing something like that, where he could see that the joy that he was giving to these young boys, you know, building this tree house in a garden. I mean, that kind of, but it was about that, that, but the way that he described being useful. And I think there's this whole element of people wanting to feel that they're valued members, you know, even if you're older and even if you've kind of done your bit. And, and I remember having an argument with my son, what he learned in, 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 um, in class in his economic lesson that once you hit 60, you're a, a drain on society, you know, economically. I'm like, what? That's just ridiculous. I had a huge oh, argument. Goodness. But, you know, so it's kind of, you know, it's, it's challenging that ridiculous, you know, sort of, you know, that, that mindset, you know. Um, uh, so I do think, uh, and actually, um, if you're in good health um, and you can, because often poor health is actually what prevents people from working. And, and often working is what keeps people going as well. They, you know, they're productive. It's like, you know, so, uh, you know, maybe not working, maybe it's volunteering or, you know, whatever it might be. But I think... Um, just, to, but a final point, just to mention again, this is one of the sadder things that have happened from COVID is, you know, the isolation that often older people do feel. And of course that was exacerbated then with lockdown. And the, so social isolation is actually one of the, it's the biggest killer of older people. So I think this is where, uh, interestingly, AI and technologies um, as a tool, certainly through COVID, for example, I mean, there was a huge explosion of, of, of technologies that were supported, certainly in the UK and I'm sure around the world, around you know, trying to connect, you know, vulnerable people with support and help and making sure that they were getting visits and, mm -hmm. you know, telephone lines, AI, AI automated phone call, uh, phone lines that could actually tell through the, even the, the voice, whether they were more in trouble, you know, so things like that, which, and this is where technology, you know, can be very powerfully harnessed. And even, even energy bills, you know, energy usage will highlight whether someone is isolated and, and you can mm -hmm. use that information those that kind of data to actually you know get in, information so so there are various ways that you can identify people who are isolated who are lonely who are, are vulnerable and are, you know are 
our, our task ahead is to make use of that technology to, to be able to help those people. Yeah, absolutely. I never thought about that. Like if the water hasn't been turned on in six weeks, then maybe go check, check in on, on that person. Yep. That's, a, that's a great point. Uh, we've got a question here from Daniel about using health apps with AI. So how, do, how does that help us? What are your thoughts on that? Well, so health apps is, a, is, a, is an interesting one. So, and uh, there are some great health apps, but there's an awful lot of bad health apps as well. So I think there's a, there's a really interesting, um, I guess, uh, and, and, and a lot of the work. So for example, the NHS, and sorry, this goes back to our healthcare system, but I, I know they spent a lot of time in actually, you know, vetting health apps that are then put onto the NHS health, health library. So what it, what it means, it's kind of like a kite mark. It's like, it's, it's rated as good and that it will, it will help you and help you help deliver a better health outcome. So I think that's the first point to say. Now, AI, AI is only as good as the data that you get. And of course, mm -hmm. we also know that data bias is a massive issue. So if you're getting data on only one type of population, it's not obviously not going to help develop. You're not going to get the right insight to be able to help a completely different population. So that was actually an issue going back to my pharma days. You know, the pharmaceutical companies used to only do trials like in men. So they kind of forgot about women or they'd be very specific, you know, so and it goes the same with data. So if you're only getting data on white men, obviously, it's going to give you a very lopsided view a, in terms of what might be needed for a totally different population, whether it's white women, black men or whatever it might be. So I just think, you know, with with health apps and, you know, the, the, the quality of the data and, the, and the, the extent of the data is also important, depending on the health app. These are really important. Getting the right data and getting good quality data is almost the most difficult bit of the challenge of developing these technologies because getting your hands on on good data is, is often very difficult. Um, means that people have to share it and also it's often locked. I mean, in, even in the health, in, in the NHS, which everyone talks about as being the gold mine of data because we've got data that follows us from birth, you know, birth to death. Well, basically but a lot of it is locked away in, in in paper files it's not it's not digitized for example so if you mm -hmm. can't get access to it and it's also siloed in many many different organizations i still don't have access to my health record and actually there's a huge amount of it, there's a lack of interconnections between different um you know if you if you see a doctor in one hospital and then you see another one and they're not communicating you're not you know so it's like so I think there's a real challenge with actually getting the right data, the best data, making sure you don't have data bias, you know, to be able to develop technology that will really be able to deliver, you know, deliver on the promise of helping you. So yeah. my, my final point, because it came up earlier, is that ethical and, and so responsible, safe application of AI is so important. So um, if anyone who's an AI developer is interested, the, the, the UK are actually really leading in the world in ethical application of AI in the health and care context. Mm -hmm. So if you Google NHSX code of conduct, you will get um, the 10 principles of ethically applied, responsibly applied AI in health and care. And it's it's recognized as, 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 as showing real leadership in, in, in this space. So I'll close there. I mean, I'll finish. Hopefully that's yeah. a question. Thank you for that. No, I was just looking through your book because I remember reading. I wanted to make sure I get the country right. I believe it was Estonia, hmm. maybe Finland, that it's really doing this well, where the, the individual actually owns their data and can share their data whenever they need to with hospitals and others. And I feel like when I read that, I even took a picture and I'm like, this just makes sense. Yeah. Because what you described was, yes, there's data in silos and it's sitting across, but it's not, it, it, there's so much opportunity there if you break those silos. Yeah and use that data to actually help people. Absolutely. And you have, you have identified what I think is a really interesting model for the future. And, um, and I think that the, the European Union is actually doing some really amazing work in this kind of ethical digital kind of digital common market is, is I know the project that they're working on. But just but just sitting at Estonia and Finland, so they're actually very close together. And actually, they do a lot of cross-border collaboration, actually aided by the fact that 
they've got this um, th this X, X road uh, project that they have embarked on together. But what's interesting about Estonia is what they have done um, is, uh, you know, it, it, this is when it, they're coming out of, you know, control over Eastern Europe and, you know, they needed to kind of establish themselves as a nation. What they have in place now, which is fascinating and I think is a really interesting model, is basically an e-citizen an e-citizen uh, platform. So, so the citizen um, has, you know, is able to share their data in ways that they decide because they have a unique code that every citizen gets. They can decide who they want to share their data with and they can have access to anything, whatever it might be. I mean, you know, they can, you know, get they can get, you know, insurance, you know, their tax records, their health records. It's all embodied in this platform. And they will know, and this, and it's not all of it's blockchain enabled, but part of it is. And of course, uh, but basically it's, it's a very secure mechanism by which they can share their data and they will know who is also ask for their data mm. so, uh, so that's really interesting as well and what it means that um, it's a much better way in which the citizen has control they are much more in control of their own lives through having ready access to their data and their records and then it, but it has also enabled uh, and facilitated a much uh, a degree of innovation that is very very difficult to match you know in countries where there isn't that flexibility and that freedom and that sort of uh, ease with which you know that data can be shared Estonia, uh, sorry Finland um, have gone, uh, have, have, uh, they've got a slightly different system, but they and also that they have a culture that's rooted in well-being, and and they're very very focused on keeping people healthy and well. Um, and uh, they have they recently, I mean, this is now uh, a year ago now, but they passed a, a whole um, a legislation on secondary use of data, which opened up again more innovation in actually accessing data on a much wider level to again fuel sort of innovation in health and care services and 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 all the rest of it. So. Um, uh, so it's quite interesting, and, and so I and, and I write a little bit about this in my book. I took a, 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 a about twenty five, um, and this is with my um, my uh, my consultant editor, actually, Melissa Reem, who've done a lot of work together. We took a, a bunch of uh, about twenty five senior individuals from the NHS and, and sort of care system over to Estonia to see what we might be able to take back, mm -hmm. and uh, and it, it kind of and and what I think is the fundamental lesson is the trust because. That is what we don't have enough of at the moment is trust in our governments and our institutions. But this, but and and of course the um, the Estonian system, it is a very very good way because the citizen are kind of they're the ones who kind of are in charge and yeah. um, because everything is very transparent because everything is very secure. It's, it has really enabled that kind of collaboration and trust with their institutions and their government. I'm not saying it's perfect, but you know, but it's a very I've heard of so far. Reading it's a very interesting model, and you know they can vote through the system. You know it's 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 this e-enabled, you know, system for government. You know, so I think it's a model to look at for the future. Yeah, know? absolutely. Um, but they have some of the same challenges as, as other systems do, where you know not everything is digitized, and yeah, you know, they have some of the same challenges as us. But I think it's the principle and the fact that they've got this unique. ID that is secure, that is controlled and managed by the citizen. It's all that those sort of fundamental principles, which I think are fascinating. Yeah. We had a, a comment here from Robin saying that she loves hearing about the importance of data quality. <laughs> yes, it's so important. It's absolutely. And there's a concept called FAIR. It's findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. That's uh, That data is gold dust. OK. <laughs> well, so, got to be fair. Okay, so we've got a question here from Matt. How can someone working on AI contribute to this movement? Where is the most help needed to accelerate the use of AI for longevity? So, I, so that's a very good question. And I would um, say that probably the most interesting area for AI at the moment, or one of the most interesting, well, there's a few, obviously. Um, I'll, give, uh, I'll mention a few names because they, they are, they're good examples of people who are really harnessing AI. So Alex Zavarankov, who runs in Silicon Medicine, fascinating, and he's he is absolutely leading the way in AI-driven drug discovery, but also in, in COVID research, but also in what I think is really fascinating at least is this whole area around aging biomarkers. Mm. Through multimodal AI and, and looking at patterns between data sets and being able to really understand what is what it, what is it? What are the insights that we need as on us as human beings at an individual level that will arm us to understand how we're aging and what are the interventions that can help us age better? Yeah. And 
you know, maybe one day achieve immortality if, if you really want to go go to the full health. And Alex, a couple of days ago, or last week, talked about he thinks 150 is not too far off in the future. But that's really so. It's, and, and these biomarkers are everything from genetic biomarkers to epigenetic, how our genes are, are influenced by our environment, um, blood, you know, what's in our blood. So there are companies that can tell through your blood markers, you know, and these are like, you know, the, the real kind of physiological data that they can uh, they can measure in your in your blood. Um, you know, when you might, they can predict when, when your estimated time of death from that, you know. Um, wow. <laughs> Um, but, you know, digital fingerprinting is really interesting. So even things like, you know, um, uh, how you handle um, uh, your, your mouse or your keyboard can sometimes you know, indicate whether you're at risk of cognitive decline, for example. So there's, uh, you know, how fast you walk. So that's uh, your gait analysis. So, you know, mm. to monitor your gait. So that's actually, so your gait, how fast you walk at the age of 45 is a very good indicator of how well you will age, interestingly. But now with technology, they can measure that and actually estimate, it. they can assess whether you're at risk of developing these neurodegenerative diseases. So what I'm saying is that all this information that we use for AI to be harnessed to develop those, that understanding of the aging biomarkers and, and what will put us at risk of disease, but more importantly, is the interventions at an individual level, but also at a population level. So that kind of research, I think, will one day, very soon, help us understand, you know, um, what is putting people at individual risk of dementia, and more importantly, what are the cures that we can start to look at? Because fundamentally, pharmaceutical companies so far have had a terrible time. They were they were, they were looking at, you know, um, the plaque formation, the brains, but that's actually too late. By that by that point, you're, it's too late. So it's really understanding what is it at a far earlier stage of disease progression, which is where the signs of aging, where aging biomarkers is so fascinating. So that is an area where AI absolutely being able to spot patterns between very diverse and disparate data sets will be very powerfully used. So that's one example. Thank you for that. Yeah. So as you were talking, I, I was thinking about genetic testing and you know doing blood work. Mm -hmm. Is there such a thing as testing too frequently or testing too much and kind of becoming <laughs> I have an obsessive personality, so I could see myself trying to know what changed from one day to the next, right? Or is, is that going to be the norm? Yeah, I, I think that's a really good point. And I, and I know, in fact, you know, there's a lot of talk about how people are using, in fact, it can be bad for your mental health, you know, using getting too, well, we know that getting too addicted to social media and being in front of your screen too much is not a good thing. And actually, funny that you mentioned, um, this was a really, really big issue with sleep apps, because you've probably heard of apps like Headspace, for example, you know, meditation apps, and then there's been a huge huge explosion of sleep apps and what they found with a lot of them is that it made people even more anxious because the more you sort of remind people about how they need to sleep this actually makes them even worse so so you know so i think there's 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 that you have to sort of be be careful of and i think like anything you know too much technology can be a bad thing but also i think uh, there's a bit of a wild west in some areas around health apps, going back to my earlier point. So I think in the end, just be really, really careful about the technologies that you're actually, you know, using. Make sure that they're that they're robust, that they've got some sort of kite mark or, you know, rated as, you know, doing the business. Because there's a lot of bad stuff out there. And, you, and I know in the early days of health tech, you know, there's loads of stuff that would sit on app stores that would never get used. Because they were just, fr frankly, just badly designed. They weren't really... Mm -hmm delivering much. So, you know, be really, really careful about how much you rely on technology. And I'll just use a slightly different example about that. Because, you know, you know how we used to have, you know, some 10 years ago, Tom Toms that would help us navigate, you know, in, with our cars getting to A to B, and we didn't need maps anymore. Well, then we also then started getting into the problems where you become so reliant on technology that you forget how to read maps. And you've probably heard of stories where big buses or big trucks would get stuck in little roads or would fall off a cliff or whatever because you become too reliant and in the end you know you have to you have to have a healthy dose of just you know using things in, in, in a, i guess in a pragmatic intelligent way technology is a friend it's a tool it shouldn't take over you know certainly not yet anyway yes absolutely i've totally been there where i'm walking around looking for a starbucks in the city and i'm like i it, this is set, telling me to go this way and i don't see it all i really had to do was I mean, it's just like right there in front of me. It's right there. I'm like, 
<laughs> don't help totally me get there, but I need to use my brain a little bit. But I totally get it. I think people have forgotten how to use. Our brains are still pretty good, I'm afraid. It's, I don't think technology is going to take over our, our brains just yet. Not yet, not yet. But not it's, yet. Maybe one, maybe, it'll probably will eventually, but not quite yet. Not Maybe not quite as quickly as some people think so. Yeah, my, my husband's father, is a he drives trucks for a living and he actually doesn't trust the, the gps he's like i'm not using that it's going to lead me to all these different roads obviously the gps is good and helpful right it gets you from point a to point b but he still uses the maps you'll see him pull over open up the big maps and he'll travel all across the u.s so and having that sixth sense having that kind of instinct too it's an intuition it's, yeah exactly having that knowledge and there's that there is an intuition intuition yeah. thing you know that's something about you yourself and this is the you know that sixth instinct that you know again we, we have these technologies are our tools and should be our friends you know yeah. not to completely take over our lives it's I, I kind of there's that that term that often is used this augmented intelligence we wanted to help and augment what we can do ourselves and i think that's really the, the space that we're in now eventually yes we're gonna have super intelligence and all the things that all the you know the real the, the, the ai you know the real futurists and the, the people leading the way yes you know that will that will come but in know, 2045 but, right or 2047 something like that well, that's where some people are saying we'll reach longevity escape velocity it's it's the year singularity that ray kurzal talks a lot about you know it's, it's all kind of connected with that but yeah Awesome. Thank you for that. So question here from a LinkedIn user. So they've changed their privacy settings. We can't see their name. But how do you how do you see to educate people on the new AI driven approaches to health in addition to reading your book, of course? Well, so I, I think, you know, when I try and update myself, I always turn to, to, to places where I can trust the information. So I think certainly in this era of fake news, I'm afraid, uh, it's actually a really big issue. Like, where can you go for trusted information in, for your health and also for, you know, technologies about your health? So that's a really, really good question. And I I think, you know, for me, I think, you know, there's a lot of, uh, uh, the, well, I'm going to turn, you know, so Peter Diamantes, who I was really pleased, gave a testimony for the uh, for the book, which I mentioned earlier. So he runs Abundance 360 and he, uh, Singularity, is, is a really good place to kind of get leading edge kind of thinking uh, on, on health and technologies in general, because of course there are a lot of influences in health technology that are coming from outside health. And I, I find that that convergence space really, really fascinating. And so Singularity does a really good job of that. There's some other kind of what I call accessible, sort of con consumer accessible, Wired is actually pretty good. Um, yeah. Fast Company is pretty good. So these are more consumer, then they're kind of, uh, uh, then they're, uh, then there are um, places like uh, NHSX, you know, and, and I mentioned the the, the apps library for, for, for trust information. That's that's you know that's a good place you know to know that you're going to get good stuff. Um, so uh, you know I, I think, and, but also I think you know there's you know the what I call the legitimate credible um, uh, um, newspapers and mags. You know they they often come out with some very very good pieces. Not all the time, and some of it you have to be a bit careful about. Um, but they, but they are, you know, they generally are quite good. So I don't know if that answers your question, but I think um, certainly there are places that uh, I go to all the time. You know, The Economist is good. Mm -hmm. um, MIT Technology Review is really good. I go to that a lot. Um, and um, uh, yeah, so those are some ideas. Okay, yeah, thank you. I think no matter what your source is, taking a few minutes to really understand. Yes, go ahead. Sorry, one more thing. Just make sure it's backed. Anything that's backed by one of the leading scientific journals is always, you know, so so you'll see when you go into my book. I mean, I have about 300 references in my book. Some are more from like more kind of newspaper type sources, but but Nature, you know, uh, sort of the Lancet. In fact, the Lancet has just come out with Lancet Healthy. So the Lancet is like this very highbrow sort of scientific journal. But they've now got digital health and planetary health, and they've now got healthy longevity, which mm -hmm. I think is interesting. It shows that there's that, that it is now a credible scientific space that needs its own brand, its own title. Um, and I know uh, people from Nature actually attended quite a few of the webinars, you know, that I ran early this year. So I think, you know, so in the end, it's about technology to help you improve your health, you know, and just focus on, you know, the, the, the you know, the robustness of how they're measuring the, the health impact. Okay, yeah, I think this is a good time for a question that I think 
people might be thinking about. So we're talking about how to live longer with AI. So what can people, you know, listening to us right now, what can they do in their life today that can help them live just a little bit longer, but not just longer, but live better? Okay. So uh, again, I'm going to go back to the fundamentals. If you, because it comes back to our, our first question. So if you want to just kind of get yourself to 80, 90 plus, you know, maybe 100, maybe even 100 plus, because that's like the new 60, according to Kudu Diamond. Um, I, think, I think if you follow that, you know, what we know are, if you follow good healthy behaviors and 75% of this term healthy life expense, you're down to following good behaviors. So don't smoke, because that's a massive drain on your health. Don't, don't, don't smoke. smoke. Don't drink, well, drinking, you know, don't go, full heavy hog on the alcohol. I think there's, you know, a, a glass or two, I think a day is probably okay. And, and actually, um, reserve, no, I can never pronounce that word, resveratrol, um, which is found in red wine, apparently has been found to, you know, uh, extend your, your ex, extend health span. Um, uh, so um, eating, uh, eating good uh, food, and what I mean, it's like not processed food, like uh, it's basically eating like like the Neanderthal. In fact, I had a very interesting talk yesterday from a guy who lives in Kazakhstan, and he was going back to how their ancestors, you know, who were very nomadic, where they, they basically ate a lot of food, you know, obviously they had to, you know, they're hunter-gatherers. They had to, like, they went through periods where they didn't actually um, uh, necessarily have food to eat. But actually, what we're finding now, and this is actually the one little tick, tip, I'll give every longevity expert that I've spoken to, and now I do it myself, they all follow intermittent fasting. So what that is, it's allowing a, 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 a long enough interval so that your body kind of goes, and I don't, and this is not about starvation, but your body goes into a mode where, where they start using up sort of, ex, you know, sort of, it, it's called autophagy, and it's basically, they basically hoover up kind of like the nasty stuff that's hanging out, the toxins, the free radicals, all the stuff that apparently does actually cause damage, you know, at a cellular mm -hmm. level, which is implicated with aging. So this is why, so they've done, um, uh, um, and I'll just say this one little story. So they've done experiments in mice where it, apparently, if you, if you quote unquote starve mice or give them a very low calorie diet, they tend to live longer. But it's not about the amount of food, it's the, the interval between when they're allowed to eat, that's the main thing. So I follow, for example, an intermittent diet. So I will go through like, uh, fasting during the day and I'll only eat at night uh, and I'll do that four days in a row so that you know that's something that I do so that's another thing that I know a lot of longevity people say say is, 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 is key to it but it's not about starvation it's about the interval um, and then it's about activity I mean physical activity and I'm not talking about hitting the gym and like spending four hours there it's about incorporating it into your daily life and so people who do a lot of gardening or who walk to the shop or like, you know, go bike to school rather than take the bus or get driven to school. It's incorporating physical activity in your daily life. That's another big part of, of aging well. And then social connections, not being lonely, friends, you know, having a purpose. Mm -hmm. So these are all the, the blue zone, what I call the blue zone um, areas. So Dan Butner, who wrote about blue zone countries like Sardinia and Italy and Okinawa and Japan. So it boils down to these fundamentals. But if you want to get beyond the 100 and you want to get to 120, this is where you'll need to start looking at the more kind of more radical interventions. And this is where that takes us into, for example, there's a lot of work going on at the Senolytics and, you know, um, drugs that eat zombie cells and get rid of them, get, get them out of the system and, you know, uh, you know, different interventions that deal with mitochondrial repair, you know, all these different mechanisms that are, at the, you know, uh, the hotbed of research at the moment in the science of aging, you know, that will that will really, really start to attack the, the cellular base of aging. Um, and then, of course, you've got gene editing and things like that, you know, which we, which is also, you know, um, you know, very, very uh, focus of, of research today. Um, but again, it has to be very ethically, you know, approached because, you know, we've had problems with people, you know, gene editing babies, you know, to be resistant to HIV that happened in China. Now the guy's in jail because it's, you know, anyway, there's all these stories that I write about in my book. Yeah. And I actually, I actually read all the stories that you, you were just mentioning. So one interesting thing about, you know, eating, eating good food. Uh, there was an interview you did with the world's strongest man. By the way, <laughs> so awesome in itself. You interviewed some really amazing people. What caught my eye right away was the world's strongest man. I'm like, how do you become the world's strongest man? But one thing he mentioned in his interview was that he changed his diet 
based on the genet the results of the genetic test. So I thought that that was really interesting. And I'm wondering if that's where the future is going, where we're all going to kind of know what we're genetically predisposed, so, you know, like what, what should we be eating based on our genes, right? So yeah. what are your thoughts on that? So, yeah, so I, I, um, I interviewed um, Eddie Hall, who's uh, the world's strongest man. And there's a dispute as to whether he's still the strongest man. Although I saw was, that, 501 kilograms or something. That's yeah. That's if you watch him on YouTube, he's, uh, he's, it's incredible to watch him lift his dead weight. So, um, and he has an incredible story. He, uh, you know, comes from a family of, of two other uh, boys in his family. He was the youngest. He knew from an early age that he had these, these gifts, you know, these, uh, phys these athletic gifts. He started out as a, as a champion swimmer, but then he realized he was really strong. And he actually went through a bout of depression when he was a teenager. He was given all these drugs, but then he realized that when he went to the gym, it made him feel better. And then he decided, and this is this is the whole story about you know this this will, this sort of this mind over matter. He decided, and he realized that he had these gifts of being really strong. He always knew he was stronger than his brothers and his father. And then he decided he was going to become the world's strongest man, and that's kind of like what drove him out of his depression. He got rid of the drugs. He then went, you know, really focused on that goal and he became the world's strongest man. And then, um, but then his title has been threatened. This happened actually during the height of the um, epidemic. And I'll go back to the, your question about the, the nutrition in a second. Um, but I'll tell the story about the epidemics is quite interesting is that um, uh, Thor, have Thor, you know, the Game of Thrones uh, Icelandic guy, apparently he deadlifted a, a kilo more than, than Eddie Hall had done in his home gym in Iceland during the height of the lockdown period in Iceland. And so there's a whole dispute as to whether that was against strongman rules and all the rest of it. But anyway, they're, they're now going to have this battle, you know, in the boxing ring. <laughs> so, of course, that's a totally different uh, skill that Eddie's going to have to master. He's going to be much more agile. So, of course, what that means is that his strength, so he's got a mutation, which is what yeah. he discovered on the epigenetic side, uh, doing his DNA analysis. And he, he discovered he had a mutation that um, the Belgian blue cattle have, which is the Hercules gene, which, uh, which is called the Hercules gene. But basically it means that he can layer muscle over muscle over, you know, so he can get really bulky. And that's what has given gave him his, his innate strength and, and I guess, advantages, you know, to be the world's strongest man. But actually, but at, at his disadvantages is cardiovascular health. So innately, he has to work a lot harder and he has to, you know, he has to be, he, so he takes omega-3 and he has to, you know, so understanding his innate gifts and also his weaknesses allow him to work and, and improve upon his performance in, in whatever task he is setting himself to be. So he's yeah. naturally not particularly quick. Naturally, his cardiovascular health is not as good. So inherently, you know, being a boxer is not going to really play in some ways to his natural strengths, but we'll, we'll see. I mean, this is, so he's obviously using everything, every bit of information at his disposal to work with the gifts that he's got, work also with what he knows are his weaknesses to overcome his weaknesses through nutrition, through, you know, this, his physical regime and, 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 you know, but microbiome and what you eat. Yeah. Obviously massively important. So he's obviously, you know, addressing all that in his in his plan. But microbiome, you know, going back to that question earlier about how AI, you know, could be used to live longer. Microbiome and understanding the interplay between our gut, bacteria. I mean, the amount of bacteria in our gut is absolutely gigantic. And actually it's um we need those those bacteria to work with what we eat to give us our health. So again, that's another big area of research which is fascinating. And also works also in tandem with our, our um, how we respond to different foods, and this goes back to the genetics and epigenetics. So it's a massively interesting area. Okay, yeah, very interesting. I mean, the other takeaway for me was uh, around the intermittent, intermittent fasting. I eat every couple of hours, so I could not eat for almost an hour, and I'm already hungry. And I ate right before the session, so. I don't know. I mean, I, my sister does it, and she she swears by it. She can go 20 hours or so without eating and. But again, that's unique to you. So I think, so this is the thing. So you have to find a, the formula that works for you. This is where that innate, that the, the sixth sense also comes in because, you know, pe people will, and even, so, so for example, people who, who are, you know, prone to or, or pre-diabetic or have to, you know, knowing how your body responds to sugar or when you get your sugar rushes and your insulin spikes and all that kind of stuff, in the end, it's a very, very unique, unique thing. And you have to kind of understand it at a, at a unique level. So, so, you know, in the end, I mean, I've always been like a camel. I can go for hours without having to eat, drink. Do you know what I mean? Like I've just always had that. So for me, it's not a problem. 
But for others, it, it might be more difficult. And then you sort of think, well, there's no point forcing something on myself if it's just not working with me at an individual level. So, you know, in the end, you have to just be pragmatic. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, I think you might be inspiring me to do at least some blood work or genetic testing. I mean, we weren't raised to go to the doctor almost ever. Unless you're half dying, you're like, you'll get over it. It's okay. So... <laughs> So you know, so so one of the things that um, came out in the talk I did recently was to you know if we had portable glucose monitors, you know that could monitor our body's response to what we eat, especially obviously the sugar and insulin side, it would be an absolute, um, uh, it would be a lifesaver because it would a it would help people you know who are most risk of diabetes and of course pre-diabetes and diabetes and obesity is such a massive thing that we have to tackle, but it will also guide you in terms of really understanding how your body responds to different foods. Um, and, you know, and again, I tell a little bit about this in, in, in the book is like we, our genetics also influence, you know, our reactions to food, how we, how we metabolize food. Some people metabolize, and we know this, but like, for example, um, people in Asia, they metabolize alcohol less well, and that's a genetic thing, but it's the same thing like, you know, carbohydrates, you know, um, uh, fats, for example, and some people, you know, they, they, they taste food differently. So that also is quite interesting. And that's a genetic thing as well. So it's really interesting. You know, that's what, again, has been thought up with all the research. Yeah, I think you mentioned uh, coffee, dark chocolate, and there was one more item. Broccoli. <laughs> Broccoli is the other thing. It tastes really bad. <laughs> well, I know kids think it tastes bad at some point. <laughs> I think broccoli is an interesting one, yes. Yeah, there was a comment that came in earlier, but so many comments came in after that I can't find the specific one, but it was very relevant to a question I had uh, for you in terms of, you know, how do we leverage AI technology to bridge some of the inequalities between health and wealth across yeah. the globe? So maybe you can talk about that. So, I mean, this is such a... Uh, this is such a difficult one, of course, and a challenging one, and, is, it, is, and it is the one that really has to... Um, be on top top of mind of, of our of our leaders, you know, in the world today. So I think, you know, in the end, I, I think, you know, certainly technology can help us understand, um, really understand what um, uh, what puts us in ill health, what we can do to put us in better health. What the technology can't do, obviously, is 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 deal with the inherent um, inequalities as a society that we've got. And this this is all about you know, our systems, you know, there's a lot of talk about how capitalism isn't working anymore. And, you know, it's, it's creating bigger divides, you know, all these sorts of things. Um, so this is where, but I do think, you know, technology can, uh, can be, uh, can certainly be used. Uh, I think I mentioned, you know, some of these things earlier, what we have seen around COVID is obviously a very, very quick response by our communities and local areas and neighbors and people to kind of do what they could to help people who are vulnerable and less, you know, less, well off than themselves. And so certainly in the UK, but I think, you know, certainly around the world, there's been a huge explosion of technologies to help identify people who are most vulnerable, people who need the most help. So people who are lonely. So we, and we, going back to the, the examples that we, that we talked about earlier, you know, energy usage, you know, being able to find, you know, people who uh, through uh, automated phone lines and even like chatbots, you can, you know, you can tell through some very brief questionnaires, even the, the, the tremors in their voice where the people are, are vulnerable. So being able to to target, you know, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, resources and response, you know, especially in a, in, a, in a high, you know, emergency situation. So these are all kind of, so there's a lot of examples like that. I think, um, I, I think uh, on, a, on a bigger issue, I'm really interested in, in things around, and I talk about, you know, I mentioned this geopolitics stuff and, 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 you know, Estonia is a really interesting example as well, because what it, what that talks about, it talks about how you can use uh, technology to have more information, you know, within control of our citizens, which allows greater access to things that will be helpful to them, you know, in their daily lives. So I think this whole concept of digital inclusion is, is really, really important. So I think one of the big things um, that I know the UK is looking at, but I think is, is so important around the world is making having access to the internet having access to digital uh, technologies and tools. I mean, I'm talking about like really simple tools. The fact that we can be on a Zoom call, like, or not a Zoom call, LinkedIn call using technology, yeah. we're able to connect. And of course now with, you know, I mean, I can do a website in a few hours with a template. I mean, yeah. I mean, five years ago or 10 years ago, that would never have been the case. So having greater access and ease so people can use these technologies. These are, I think, at the heart of how we can really 
level up society. Um, so, so I think that having access to technology is really important and giving education to people to use this technology is really important. Um, and, um, and I think there's a bigger thing around harnessing data, which I talk about in the book. So rather than drive up the profits of the companies that we know full well, which are not just in the US, they're also very, they're also in China and places like that, you know, which, which are using, but using data in a way that can be harnessed more widely for the public good, I think is a really interesting model. And this is where EU and countries like Estonia and Finland are doing some really interesting work. Uh, the Finnish um, uh, innovation body called CITRA, if you look them up, S-I-T-R-A, they have a, what they call the, uh, the I can't remember what exactly, but it's the, the, the banking equivalent of a human-driven data economy where they harness data for the wider public good and for societal good. I think that's really interesting. And that's that really starts to then get us into a territory where we can actually start addressing the inequities of society. Um, and so I think that, and I write about that in the book as well. Yes, you heard about everything in the book. One thing I'll point out is this book is not a thin book. I remember getting it in the mail, I'm like, wow, this is this can kill this book. This can you can throw it at somebody. But um, one other thing that you mentioned in the book is life data, right? So what does that actually mean, and how can we share this, and how can this impact us, and how does that make us live longer, happier, healthier lives? So that kind of goes back to this sort of ethical data economy that I was talking about. So, yeah. so I talk in terms. So, uh, so just very. So what? So de the determinants of health. What keeps us healthy and well? Most of it is not about healthcare and the and what we get in treatment in hospitals. That's about ten to fifteen percent. Most of it is about all things we were talking about for clean air, good food, you know, good education, not being poor. These all these, what I call the wider determinants of health. So life data is, is all the data. I mean, some people call it call it in terms of data exhaust, which of course they're hoovered up by the big tech companies. And of course they're totally invested in health because they know that that data, that data that exists as we live our lives, that we are generating as a result of living our lives, the food that we're buying in supermarkets, you know, the energy usage that we talked about before, you know, the sensors that might monitor, monitor our, our, our gait, you know, as we're walking in the homes, you know, all that data is it's it's all this data that we're creating as we live live our lives this is this is where the aging biomarkers and the digital fingerprinting comes in that i was talking mm -hmm. about earlier all that life data as we're living our lives we can harness that data get the insights that we need to develop the products and services that we can develop to keep us healthy and well what i call socially responsible products and services so not it's not just anything that's just going to drive up profits of companies and big tech and all that kind of stuff i'm talking about products and services that will generally deliver a better quality of life and also um, drive a research at a population health level. So if we're sharing our data, and if we feel comfortable about sharing our data, and there's a whole issue of trust, of course, with that, which of course yes. is a massive issue that we have to overcome. But there's an interesting, um, what I call these um, local data models, these civic data mo models that I talk about in the book, which is where the public, you know, going back to the, what we've seen during COVID, community mobilizing themselves and people trusting, you know, their, their, their kind of local areas and the, their houses. And, you know, if we had data models that were more built around that kind of trust and a more kind of, these are the really interesting models of the future that, you know, are, are, are ones that we need to be looking at um, to drive our, our thinking in a sense. But this is what I mean by live data, and actually um, by understanding the products and services that keep us healthy and well, but also, for example, allow us to save better for a longer life, because mm -hmm. a lot of us aren't saving enough, you know, our retirement portfolios. If we're going to have a much longer life, we need to have the money to keep us going. So even like products that, you know, incentivize us to do a little bit of saving, like when we start young, like there's a lot of like put some money, but you know, if you buy something like one penny goes off into your savings account, or whatever it might be like that, or you're incentivized to keep healthy and you're given rewards. And of course, health insurers are already doing this, yeah. but then you get rewards, you might get like you know, a bit more, you know, get pennies into your savings account, and then it creates because, of course, if you're if you are worried about money, if you don't have enough money, then obviously that's a drag on your health and well-being. So that is also part of the solution. So, so I think there's this it's some really interesting work. And of course, the real one of the guys I interviewed, interviewed in my book called Dmitry Kaminsky, he's already developing a longevity bank where you're rewarded um, by keeping healthy and well, you know, and given the health tech tech products and you know. So these so I think there's just a whole Really oh, there we go. Hello. Oh, yeah, you froze for a second. Yeah. I'm back. But you're back, yes. 
Okay, so um, we have a, a fun comment here from, from Pedro, and I, I promise I'll wrap up in a, in a minute. He, I just love this. He said, I could listen to Tina for hours, and I could as well. I know we just went over an hour, and oh. I knew about half an hour. So, <clears throat> so he said, democratization of technology is truly a way to level the playing field where geography, social status are often disablers. Access to the internet being a human right for all humanity, no different from water. I, I agree. Thank you, Pedro. So, Tina, as you answer my last question here, I'm actually going to share my screen and announce the winners that PACT has selected um, for you know, receiving a free copy of your book. So the last question I have for you is where can people go to get a copy of your book, given that you know not everyone's going to win today. It's three people. Everyone had great questions, um, but we, they, you know, we get, did get three names. And where can people contact you to continue the conversation? So there's a few contact details, but but in terms of the book, if you just literally, you know, Google live long with AI, Tina Woods, Amazon, you'll go straight to the Amazon product page because I've I've been directing people there. So that's that's should get you there. No problem. I also have a website, which is livelongerbetter.org, which if you go, will have everything to do with the book. It has the Amazon link. It has everything, you know, there. Um, including all the people I interviewed, their biogs, their COVID stories. So, that, so that's a really good place to go. And it also has a contact page of how to get in contact with me. So that keeps it simple. LiveLongerBetter.org is how you can get everything you need to know about the book and, and how to contact me. Um, uh, and, you know, I'm on Twitter at Tina Woods, um, on LinkedIn at Tina Marie Woods, I think it is. Or no, it's at Tina Woods. Oh, I can never forget. Um, but yeah, these are all ways that you can, you can uh, get in touch with me as well. Awesome, thank you so much. And now I will go ahead and share this slide with the winners. So we've got Pedro Cardoso, Daniel Zaldana, and uh, Matt Sturgeon. Congratulations, you guys are winners of the book. You will get the actual hard copy of the book shipped to you from PACT. So thank you, thank you so much for providing some really great questions. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead back in full screen mode. Uh, Tina, again, I just really wanna thank you for the book, thank you for the session. I'm about a third of the way through the book and I truly couldn't put it down when I started reading it oh. weekend. I know it just came out, what, October 9th or 10th, right? It's yeah, it's just it's just literally out for like, um, you know, a week. <laughs> yes, well, congratulations. I think it's an amazing book. And oh, thank, thank you so much for reading it. I'm so grateful because, you know, whenever oh, you write a book, you think, oh my God, is, everything, is anyone going to read it? <laughs> I, I have a feeling 1.4 million people from the NHS are going to read it. Everyone in the data community is going to read it. So thank oh, you for thank taking you. the time to talk to thank me. Thank you. Thank you, Kate, and everyone who came to watch. So thank you so much. Awesome. Have a great rest of your day. Yeah, same to you. Thanks, Kate. Cheers. <laughs>